always the case that you can do anything you put your mind to. As a kid, I wouldn't even dare to dream about going to the Olympics. Now I've got like a really good opportunity. If a manager's looking at two potential riders for the team, the one guy's got the YouTube. Easy decision. It's definitely a bit lost for a while in terms of identity. I probably could have gone to Oxford. I can still say I beat Mark Hamish in a sprint. <laughs> like, that counts. You get to the start line, you have to tell yourself you deserve to be here. And from one day, it's all great to the next day no emails from no one. If I make like a tiny wrong adjustment, I'll go into the barrier and crash and probably get hit by 50 riders. And I was like, oh, like immediately knew I'd made a mistake. Don't start me about notion. The feeling of going through and people shouting your name and the crowd screaming and the flags and the bells. Unreal. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Extrospective podcast. Today I am joined by Red Walters who has very kindly to agree agreed to uh, to come on to an episode. And as we've done with all of them so far, we're going to start off by asking Red how we know each other and how we came across each other uh, originally. Yeah, thanks uh, thanks for having me on. I'm pretty sure that you might be I might be wrong on this, so correct me if I'm wrong. I think the first time we met was Downton Downton Tuesday. And I remember, I think, like, we'd message a bit on Instagram or something. And then I'm pretty sure you started just before, just, just after me in the time trial. And that was the first time I met you, I, I think. Yeah, it was, uh, what was that, 2017, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was my first ago. race. And I remember featuring in your video, actually. That was quite good. Like, uh, I, had, I didn't have any, like, proper equipment at the time. And I just wore bib tights with just a base layer. Oh, so it was weird because you could see the base, like the big oh. parts going over, and there's just a video of me. I assume your dad, your dad took it yeah. of me just getting aero for like four seconds. I was like, I wanted to, I've made it onto the YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, those were good times. They were good races, weren't they? Yeah, those are so fun. I wish I wish they'd come back. And so, I suppose the question for all of the two listeners who don't already know who you are from kind of mutual circles and stuff, can you explain to everyone who's Red Walters? Who are you? Yeah, so I'm, I'm Red Waters. I guess the main thing now about me is I'm a cyclist. I represent Grenada. Um, that's where half my heritage is. So I'm currently representing Grenada in cycling. And I currently, well, this year, have been riding for River World Tight, which is a UCI continental team based in the UK. So if you're not, I guess, not all of your viewers are going to be cycling like in that bubble. That's like the third division down in terms of where, where everything sits. So yeah, we've been doing like some races in the UK. It's been a few races abroad, but yeah. So mainly cycling. I've got a bunch of other interests, but yeah, I think it's Red the Cyclist at the moment. So to give a bit of context, before we dive into all the things you've been up to in, in the more recent years, what were you like as a child? Five, six, seven-year-old Red, what was school like for you? How do you describe yourself? Oh, that's a, that's a war. I've just gone right down like in the memory, memory lane. I think I liked school, actually. You know, I had a like, good group of friends. Primary school, at least, it was like just, yeah, a bit of fun. I wasn't that focused like academically. I mean, I was always like good at maths. Like that's, that was my thing from my childhood. Like maths was just, it just came to me. So I was quite fortunate in that respect. And then like other subjects like English just didn't really care too much about it. And then, you know, moving to secondary school and sixth form especially, that's when I sort of realized that I could focus on academics a bit more. Or that's when I guess I cared about it a bit more and put a bit more effort into it. And that was read the, the guy who cares about, you know, grades and stuff. That was my focus at that point. So sixth form, I was like, you know, full gas on on grades and uni and stuff and then yeah three weeks before uni that's when i made the surprise decision to just like abandon it or i suppose um what's it called defer it which uh, i've not i ended up deferring it for like three years in the end <laughs> but yeah defer it for cycling and yeah that's how i i got to where i am today <laughs> it's, a, it's a tricky one it was a really hard decision and it's like it's one that i half regretted for a really long time like i probably could have gone to oxford I got the grades and stuff for it. I missed out on the interview, but I'm I'm not salty about that anymore. I was at one point, but I, I, I screwed up the interview. But either way, it's one of those things, like, I guess that was an insecurity of mine, like the intelligence, because I didn't go to uni. And, you know, everyone, like, loads of people go to uni. That was hard to miss out on. But it's... And there are people who go to uni and still train to be at a top level. Like, it's possible. But for me, I think to be 100% focused on it and, like, not let a single aspect down... I just, I, yeah, I needed it to, it to be just cycling. And, you know, I can always, if I want to, I can always go back to uni. It's not like that's a door that ever really closes. So I, I, I'm, I'm happy with my decision for now. Yeah, I mean, I think you've been quite, I suppose, enterprising with everything that you've been able to do as well with the cycling. It's not like you've just kind of locked yourself away and trained full time and tried to make it professional. You know, you're, you're out there trying to get 
brand deals and putting yourself out there and doing content creation, which allows it to work and kind of continuing and, and kind of remaining still in like the formative years and trying to understand Red as a person before we, we delve into the cycling stuff. Not just how were you like as a child temperamentally, but what were your sort of aspirations when you were younger? What were your like favorite hobbies before you found cycling? So firstly, temperamentally, I think I'd always been quite a... I don't, know, I don't like to use the word self-aware, but I think to a degree that maybe, and I don't like to say I'm more than other people, but I was definitely quite aware emotionally of, of things that I was doing from like really young. Like for example, when I was three or maybe, no, it must've been like five or something. I vowed never to say I hate you to any of my family or anything like that. Looking back, it's one of those things like what made me do that. And there was loads of like little things that made me think I was quite, um, I don't know. I think I was just quite thoughtful in that way, but I was also fairly angry like not just like really angry all the time but less less controlling i think it's a better way to put it like not that i was angry but when i was angry i was angry i think <laughs> what, uh, what, what, what angered you well call of duty for a start <laughs> <laughs> i remember <laughs> oh man so many yeah fair few arguments had from just raging at, at call of duty and like my poor sister who's like room is right next to mine hear me uh shouting down the uh down the mic and stuff but i think if anything that that kind of thing teaches you to just get a bit more of control. And now I'm at a point in that respect where I've got, I'm pretty happy with, you know, the level. I just don't really get angry. That's one of the things that I would say I've sort of developed in. And then confidence is another thing. It's weird in primary school. I don't know. I found confidence really easily. I suppose when you're a kid, it's fairly easy to have confidence. And then obviously you go through to the teens and it's like some people kind of have that knock where you just get a bit quiet. And I was one of those people. It wasn't confidence in the terms of self-belief but confidence in like speaking to people for example speaking in front of a crowd that kind of level of confidence and that's where the last few years I've just had to just make an effort like a real effort to just change that about myself so yeah probably the last four or five years maybe just before lockdown it was like I can't live like just being I guess shy shy is the word how would you say your parents kind of influenced you when when you're that sort of age and kind of shaped your character is there anything you can pick out in traits um in, in your parents that you can kind of identify and say oh maybe that's maybe that's where I got that kind of from yeah I think determination is one thing whether that's the right word or not I remember so clearly anytime there was any kind of task that you know me and my sister didn't think we could do um or we'd say oh I give up or something my dad would just give me that look like give up what does that mean like literally like that wasn't that didn't exist. What does that mean? Couldn't comprehend it. And then there was another thing. He'd always say, feel the fear and do it anyway. And there's a book called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. He said that probably hundreds or thousands of times. You know, that also comes back into the whole confidence thing. I use that and it's all become part of my philosophy. And, you know, same with my mum as well, like similar things where I think just that self-belief. And I think parents can often be criticised for telling their kids they can do anything. But for me, it was always a case of you can do anything you put your mind to. So anything that if you commit to something and you want it badly enough and you do what it takes to get there like you can do it and it's just that that self-belief that anything is possible you mentioned the fact that obviously you represent Grenada uh, as a cyclist you're born in the UK how has it been having family over there and family in the UK and is there any sort of attributes that you can say oh I've actually got that side from my mum um specifically because of that it's funny actually the cultural difference is it's a different world. Like, you know, sometimes we'll spend Christmas at my dad's parents' house and then sometimes it'll be at my mum's mum's house. Obviously, it's a different set of people, obviously a different culture. And it is, you just tend to get a completely different, I don't know, it's, it's just, yeah, everything's different. And I guess where I could get different attributes from, it's hard to say, like, where I've picked up because I think I pick up, I pick up so many things from so many different places in, as a general rule for my, my personality as a whole. It's hard to even describe. It's just, yeah, they're very, very different. Was there any sort of challenges growing up having that two different parts of your family? Were it, like, Did you find it ever as problematic, whether in school or with family, or was it just something that you just embraced and accepted? Well, so I grew up in London. I went to school, primary school in Wimbledon. So that was like, it's a very diverse place for a six-year-old or whatever age, you know, that age range. It wasn't even a thought. You know, there's people from literally all over the world in your classrooms and then so my family we went traveling for a couple of years because we did a lot of sailing so we sailed down through Europe and then across to the Caribbean and then Grenada where we stayed there for a year with my grandma so it was like all the opposite spending that time like fully immersed in that culture and then coming back here again we moved to well 
down south in Hampshire, which is much, much less diverse than uh, London. So it was like a case of being, you know, in a really diverse place to literally being like the only black kid in the school. It wasn't negative for me for the most part. You know, there's always going to be a few comments or a few people who are just not great people. But more of an identity thing, it was sort of, I was I was definitely a bit lost for a while in terms of identity. And even more recently, like, I have struggled in, I guess, where I sort of place myself in my own head in terms of identity in various, various places. Obviously, culturally is a big one. And, you know, now I've sort of found my own way in terms of, you know, it doesn't have to be one thing or a different thing or a different thing. It's like you just, you build your own mixture of, of the way you act and the way the way you do things. And so I know you've mentioned it a few times in sharing and for the listeners that don't know you or don't know your story, was there any particular moment in which you found cycling and made that split decision? Because I know you were interested in obviously some other hobbies as you're younger. You, you've mentioned Call of Duty, but I'm sure you weren't going to be a like, pro MLG player or, or whatever they whatever they call that. But <laughs> yeah. when was the decision to kind of find cycling, find sport uh, as opposed to other things? Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I played you know, video games for ages, I was never good enough to even consider being like, you know, pro. I was sailing for a really long time, like dinghy sailing. That was like my sport from literally from the age of four till 12 or 13. Uh, And I was fairly good, like at a club level, but not, you know, not crazy. And then it was coming up to GCSEs and it was a really weird sort of, there was no, at least I don't remember there being any sort of um, push or suggestion from anything, but I wanted to start something, a sport or, you know, something physical. And I've always been, I always consider myself to be quite strong, like, you know, arm wrestles in the playground. I was always pretty good at those. And, you know, I wanted to put that somewhere. And I was looking at hobbies and RC car racing had been something that had taken my, taken my fancy. Because also when I was younger, I used to do mini motor racing, which was for a really short time. But that's something I enjoyed. And I was like, okay, if I can't do motor racing, you know, RC car racing is like the next closest and quite cheap thing. So it's between that and cycling, weirdly. But I made it, ended up, long story short, making up, making a deal with my dad. If I got enough A's in my GCSEs, he'd buy me a bike. Um, and I literally got like the exact number of A's that we'd agreed on. So he got the bike. I remember he like went after work, picked it up on the way home. And yeah, got this bike. The first thing I thought when I arrived was like, oh, this is weird. I'm not sure I like this. Like it was it was two sizes too large for me. And I felt like I was too, you know, it was too small basically. And it's just getting used to the way you ride a road bike as opposed to like a mountain bike. But anyway, I, for some weird reason, I was like, I was still really interested in it. I think I entered a race. It was an under-16 race, which I don't even I don't talk about as my first race anyway. But I entered a race the week after I got it. Got lapped three times, came second last. The only guy who came last was like an age category down. But I was like, no, I, I want to I wanna beat these guys. It was a weird... And, you know, I've always been competitive anyway. But um, there's just something about cycling. I think everyone, agree, every, everyone seems to say the same thing. It's like you just want to get better. And that sort of desire to get better, to be successful and win... It was like from that moment, I literally remember I posted on Instagram after that first race. I think the the caption was the training begins here. Hashtag pro cycling, hashtag something, something. And it's, I find it kind of funny because like what, I had no idea what it took. I entered, I think I'd, I'd been speaking to some race organizers like, hey guys, yeah, can I enter your cat three race or cat two race? I think I'm good enough. I cycle one mile to school each day. So I should be, should be all right. And it's like, I had no clue. But something there, you know, made me want to do it. That's really insightful, actually, because that kind of, again, the crossroads between going down RC racing and cycling is not something, it's just, they're so completely different. It's like, how can those two be the choices? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah, I know. But then, yeah, I mean, I I suppose both of them have the elements of, of gamification and competitiveness. And I suppose with cycling, you then have the added benefits of, being outside, being fit, being healthy, and you can actually see more quantifiable improvements, maybe? Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I don't know if you're analysing it to, to this degree. No, nah, I, I definitely wasn't. <laughs> no. no. Um, but yeah, well, what is it that kind of made you fall in love with cycling? Because it, it is a fantastic sport, and we can share in that, and many of the people listening can can appreciate that. But, but many also don't cycle. Many can just see us and be like, why would you want to go out on a on a Sunday morning when it's the middle of winter and do six hours of zone two. <laughs> yeah. where, where does that drive come from? Yeah, I find that really interesting, actually, because until, well, probably until a, a year or two after I started, I just assumed everyone was in the same boat as me. And then you sort of go on and learn that actually 
there's a lot of reasons why people like cycling and a lot of reasons why people even like racing as well. So, so for me, it's, it is about racing, you know, obviously that competitive, I've always been just so, so competitive to the point where at some ages it was like too much and I had to dial it back because, you know, I was that kid who turned everything into a race, everything into a competition. And it's like, bro, stop. Like it's, it's, it's too stressful as just, well. Just enjoy the things sometimes. Yeah. You yeah. can't compete over like who's eating their food fastest for every meal <laughs> and like that kind of stuff. So I dialed it back, but still, yeah, super competitive, you know, like a lot of people, I like winning. So for me, that's, that's literally what it's all about. And then sort of probably later on comes the stuff of, you know, the self-improvement stuff. That's a, an addictive game in itself. And the training is fun. Like I don't, I don't mind training. I don't dislike it, but it's not, it's not to me what racing is. And for some people it's like, they just love going out for that zone two hack for four hours. That's like, that's it for them. But I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that's not, that's not my main motivator. Yeah. Cause I, it's something that I'm trying to be, tried to understand in myself, setting myself against uh, people like yourself or, or like my housemate last year, Tom, obviously living with him for a year, understanding that kind of mindset, which definitely shares with you in terms of being so competitive, wanting to beat other people in racing. And I've just never felt the, the need to beat anyone. I do everything for myself, which is why I suppose I've never really fallen in love with the racing and, and I've not really felt the need to beat the other people. I just want to improve myself. And it's yeah. weird how those, it's almost like a binary thing. It's like, you're either hyper competitive or I, I just don't care. <laughs> and, I, and I don't know why. I don't know why that is. Do, do you think there's any anything in particular that, like, just about the competitiveness, I don't know if you could think or unpack that a little bit more because it's something that really interests me. I'm convinced that's like an innate way of thinking. Because I think, so for example, my sister, who you could assume largely has the same upbringing, she just isn't competitive like that. You know, she enjoys things and she enjoys bettering herself. Like she goes to the gym, like loads. She's jacked, but um, <laughs> she like competitive. That's just not a focus for her in the same way as, as it is for me. And it is, yeah, like I think I th I'm convinced it's like a natural thing. It's almost, it's just at such a deep level that like, I want to beat this guy, like in any, just a smaller situation. You know, I'm riding next to someone, just that, that feeling of someone like next to me. I want it. It's just, it's hard to even put into words, to be honest. It's just, uh, yeah, it would be really interesting to like, I'm sure someone somewhere has done like a, I don't know, a PhD on it. We could like dig up some papers. Yeah. I guess now we're going to talk about the next choice point for you, which was coming out of sick form. You say you worked really hard and you nailed the A-level exams and that was your focus with cycling gradually increasing in importance. And then obviously you make that decision. What was it that you were going to potentially study at uni? Yeah, so I was going to do maths with computer science. I did at A-levels, maths, further maths, physics, and computer science. And in the end, like, so physics would have been the one that I would have dropped, but kept anyway. And I didn't really have a great teacher, so I just let that slip. So then for the three subjects, maths, further maths, uh, computer science, I got A star, A, and then physics, I got a C in, which it's a bit disappointing for like the trend, but I can't complain. It's four subjects, you only need three to you know get in. And then the decision to defer, like I said, three weeks before I made the call, I was like, nah, I'm just going to cycle for a year. Just enjoy it. Racing, go to race, you know, full time, all that. I had a few jobs around that time at various periods, but yeah, long story short, I took the gap year. And then it was actually 2017. That was it. It was 2017 that I took the gap year. And then 2018, when I, I was going to go to uni again, that was when I got the contract with Vetus, which is the UCI continental team. I was like, well, I can't. I can't go to uni now. Like I've just got this con. Like I would be ashamed to like not give that a hundred percent. And then sort of that mindset kept on going. Like with more opportunities, it was like well, I can't because in, in my mind, going from full time to uni would be something where I would struggle to keep improving at the same rate. And like I'm all about improving and and that and that kind of thing. And I feel like going from for me at least, going from having all the time to train, to eat, to plan, like everything, do as well as possible to then having limited time, I just feel like I wouldn't be able to get the same amount out of myself. So yeah, I deferred it and deferred it and deferred it. And then I just cancelled it because, you know, for the foreseeable, it's like, I'm, I'm in a good spot right now, slowly becoming more sustainable for me, cycling is. So it's like, okay, let's just go with this, see where we can go and just shoot for the absolute top. Because, you know, you won't get an opportunity, an opportunity like that again. Fantastic. And just before I ask a follow-up question, just my own curiosity, really. What what uni was it that you were potentially going to go to? 
It was Bath, and then I deferred it and changed it to Southampton. Once you deferred, you kind of thought to yourself, well, if I am going to go, I still need to be able to have... I mean, I assume you'd like live at home then and kind of commute in. Dream or think about being able to make that kind of impact to people, but you do. And it- Dialed in. I can definitely vouch for the fact that it's... Not that I'm training at the same level or I have the same aspirations as you, but from my experience, when I did first year of uni and I was trying to do 18-hour weeks on the bike, it's definitely a lot harder with the balance, purely because you don't... You underestimate how tired you are from cycling mentally as well. Like, you get off the bike, it might be a long session, it might be a short session, doesn't matter what it is. You think, okay, I'm physically tired, now I'm going to have a shower, eat, and then switch on mentally to do like a two-hour session of revision. No, nah, it, it doesn't work like yeah. that. Like I read you, a, you're mentally waxed as well. I read a thing saying that like from a energy spent point of view, your brain is the most demanding muscle in your entire body, which I can't I mean I can't I don't know how legit that is. I can't remember where I read it. But you know, it makes sense. I remember after my exams and I think a lot of people are the same, I was waxed like for two weeks straight after you've got exam, exam, exam for three weeks. I was finished, like couldn't ride a bike, couldn't do anything for literally a bed bound for two weeks. So it's like, yeah, like you say, going the other way, going from doing a heavy session, you can't really, focusing, I can't, I can't do it. Some people find it clears their mind, but <laughs> it's, it is really difficult. Maybe one hour zone two can clear your mind, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything that actually requires any effort, nah, <laughs> there's, there's no coming back. That's the day off at that point for a, for a long session. There's a couple of things I kind of wanted to ask you about that do actually come before this. So I'm I'm sorry to kind of disrupt the timeline because I'm trying no to get worries. everything roughly in chronological order. But if we kind of look at, I'm going to remember, forget the name now, but I remember there was something which you were invited to and you were part of a TV series and then it got cancelled. Can you <laughs> maybe explain that for me? Because I can't remember. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm I'm still salty. Well, I mean, no, I'm I'm over it. Just about over it now. Like five years later, so it was a channel called Bike Channel, and they had a TV show called The Coach Pro. And the quickest way to describe the premise of that was that it was like The Voice, but for cycling. So they started with like 50 guys. They took us all to a gym for the first episode, and we did an FTP test, and they narrowed that down to 40 guys. Um, the next episode, we went to Brands Hatch. And we did like, I think we did, yeah, so they split us in two groups and they did a race each and then top four go through from each race or top five maybe. And then, so that was 10, 10 guys total. And then with those 10 guys, they split us into two again. So five each and we did a, ti- a team time trial each and that they literally just took one person from each team or just one person or two people total even, each coach. There was two coaches, each coach got to pick a guy. Um, and I was in the final two for that. And then they took us to the Halt route in France. So they literally like flew us out to Switzerland do this awesome like seven hour route through the Alps. So that was the first time, funnily enough, that I like appreciated like natural beauty and like the environment. And I was like, damn, views are actually kind of cool. But before that, my opinion was, you know, I can always go on Google Images, but no, that was, <laughs> it was pretty really special. Anyway, so yeah, we got the final two of that. That was amazing. I was, you know, not gonna lie, confident as I am. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna beat this guy. Like I- I'm gonna win this. And the winner got a contract with a uh, UCI continental team in the UK called Canyon. And that was like, they're, well, they still are the biggest, best. <laughs> they, they've team in the survived UK. the, the yeah, last well, <laughs> six years. <laughs> literally, like the only team to still be around since then. Anyway, so I was like, yeah, this is feeling good. And then the channel went bust, went into administration. The show went down, like fully cancelled. Like from one day, it's all great. To the next day, no emails from no one. Had to hand the bike back. We had this really nice, it was like I'd never had like a nice bike before that. I'd had like second hand. So to have this like carbon aero bike with Altegra DI2, I was like, whoa. It's crazy. Anyway, I had to hand that back. It was really sad. And I think, yeah, that's one of those things. I'm still here now. I'm still, you know, I still trained all this time. I've still got to that level of team. So yeah, it's not it's not the worst thing in the world. Made it happen through through sheer determination, which as you say is is infinite. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> your your phrase. Yeah, that's little, funny. That I made that phrase. Yeah, I need to copyright that. I made that phrase when my sister was asking for some quotes for her art homework she had to do like some stylistic <laughs> like representation or whatever and she asked some quotes and i wrote 10 down and that was the first one i wrote and i was like you know what i'm keeping that i'm gonna use that straight in the instagram bio yeah yeah exactly awesome so yeah to kind of get back on track i mean like, that's something i was just personally interested in so i, I hope anyone listening or watching can also uh, appreciate that story for a bit of context but to kind of look at then yeah you, you got the vitus contract and 
that was the the year after the gap year your first time racing for you know proper outfit at the time it's that step up and the opportunities that come with that the contract gives you the belief and okay let's let's put our eggs in the basket here can you take me through maybe what some of those early experiences felt like i mean to start off with how did you get the contract i was determined from from those heath races actually that we did i think it was like july august summertime i was determined from them i was like i'm gonna get i really want to get on a continental team for next year in retrospect whether i was ready or not is you know, up for a debate but you know i really wanted that i was emailing every conti team in the uk i mean there's only like five or four at the time um i think i'd emailed like all the ones in europe as well like i would literally like if there was a uci i think i ended up it might have been the year after but at one point i emailed literally every uci team in europe so if you're a UCI team manager, check your emails from four years ago because you've got one from me. And, you know, I was really like, I put together a CV, like an infographic. Like I was really like on it with that. And obviously in conjunction with my YouTube channel, I was just trying to, you know, portray the best possible version of myself. And I'd literally given up. I couldn't find, i have done everyone. I couldn't find the email for Vetus. And I stumbled upon it on the UCI website. So I sent it off. And then like five days later, uh, the manager at the time, Sherry, she emailed me back like, oh, we've watched some of your videos. Uh, we think it's really cool. We think you're really cool. Come out to the service course and we'll show you around and have a chat. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So I went there and it sounded like, you know, they'd already made up their mind. They were going to offer me the contract. And it's like from there, it was just like insane. Because that was, especially compared to now, that was a really well-funded team. So it's like, you know, they've got a service course of racks and racks and racks and racks of bikes, wheels everywhere. And then, you know, we turn up to team camp. They've got team car, team bus, or not bus, to like team van. Uh, we're in the Diamante Hotel in Calpe, which if you've been to Calpe, that's like the hotel to be. So it's like the super nice hotel. We've got bikes, you know, all this kit. There there I am, like trying to find the kit on 50% sale and waiting for it, sales to spend 20 good on a jersey. And then they give me this just suitcase full of kit and skin suits. So it was like insane. You know, I'm on the same team as Ed Clancy. He's won Olympic gold medals. It was just, yeah, it was mad. You have to let the contract sort of change the way you think. You get to the start line, you have to tell yourself you deserve to be here. You go to a Nat B, for example, where you're the only Conti team there, you have to sort of believe you are a level above because your team your team is a level above and the other riders are going to treat you like you're a level above, you know, in terms of how they race you. So you do have to really believe it. And I think that does affect, like, there's a whole conversation to be had about race psychology. But at the end of the day, it's, it, I don't think I was quite at the level to be on that team. I think... It would have been good if I was in that top half of riders, but I wasn't there. I was probably, you know, realistically bottom third. You know, I had a really good sprint back then, but in terms of an engine and road racing, I just wasn't quite at that level. And I could have been, you know, I could have gained a lot of experience, but they didn't end up racing me that much. So I think I did like one road race with the team and a couple of a couple of crits. I calculated that I ended up doing more sponsored sportive miles, which is just like, you know, they have a few sponsors that ask for these sportives. I did more sponsored sportive miles than race miles with the team so at the end of the year it was like okay this was a cool opportunity but mm, it, it wasn't that good but again like i don't regret it it was still like a lot of great lessons learned so yeah just something to learn from and move on really yeah, like, and then didn't vitus fold after that year or something like they, something they, happened to them they ran for they ran for 2020 and then that's when covid happened and then they folded after that so yeah i mean that's pretty pretty standard story story with um like uk British team that's just ever since 2016 2017 or maybe just before 2015 that was like the peak of you know the stories about guys getting like six figures on a Conte team and it's like the money just has just slowly declined and now it's just it's I think it's a struggle yeah because it was, it was all the hype from the Olympics wasn't it and then you kind of you gradually get to the point where actually local councils and the governments that kind of facilitate and make racing easier in the UK don't do that and you, yeah. you, you, I mean, this is a conversation that's it's really hard to have, but it's such a con- consistent theme across. You'll speak to anyone and you'll say, well, you go abroad into Europe to race and the, the prize money is amazing. The race entries are really cheap. All the locals are happy to have the roads closed so that you can go and cheer these like fourth division yeah. under 23 riders <laughs> past their village. Yeah. Whereas the UK, it's like you basically have no closed road, no closed road racing. And if you do, then everyone's just bitter and resentful about the fact that they can't drive around Guildford for that one weekend where there's a Guildford Town Centre crit, which is yeah, is a bit of a shame, isn't it? So, 
continuing to move through then, you've done your gap year, now you've done your year for, for working for racing providers. I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but how are you supporting yourself whilst doing that? I mean, are you like living at home and working part time, I guess? But what, yeah, so, how, how are you managing that? Well, firstly, I was always like good at saving. Like, I, I've been, I guess at that point in my life, especially, I was just, I was so frugal. Like, I was living at home. So, like, food, you know, my parents were nice enough to let me live at home without paying rent. You know, they buy food. So that's like covered. I did have various part time jobs. And then now. Cycling isn't cheap, is it? <laughs> no, oh, it's not. It really isn't. The more independent you become, the more you realize, damn, like, there's just everything just adds and adds and adds and adds. And it's, it's a bit crazy. But now I'm like super fortunate to be sorted by SIS like financially. So that's what allows me to keep riding full time. You know, it's one of those things. If that didn't happen, then I can't say for certain that I'd still be riding full time. So I'm like, immensely, immensely grateful to them. It's very much make, make or break financially at that point, isn't it? And that's that's what stops a lot of young riders from continuing because it, it gets to that cut off point where, you know, the parents are going, look, mate, you're, you're 20, 21. Either you start paying rent or you move out or something happens. And it's like, yeah. it's like keeping the dream alive and, and trying to facilitate that. I think the, the fantastic thing about what you've been able to do, which we will touch on uh, as well, is the content creation and the YouTube channel side of things because what started is making some video on how to I've got a, I've got a note to the side how to fix system and compress memory oh, yeah. <laughs> which I I, was doing my, I, was doing my I remember it <laughs> that's like the first video on, on your YouTube or maybe the second video on your YouTube channel which that's the well so that it's not it's not the first video it's the only one I've left unprivated because it's got like 60,000 views or something crazy. But, oh, so did you used to do those kind of videos before? No, so that's the only tech support video I ever did because I had this problem on my computer for like, it, oh, it must have been months and months and I couldn't find a solution. I ended up finding it like deep buried in some Reddit thread and I was like, oh, I have to tell the world about this. <laughs> and you know how when you find a problem and you go on a YouTube video and it's like a 10 minute video and some guy's like, what's up guys? It's like X uh, tech help man 123. I'm going to be, and it's like, bro, just show me how to do it. <laughs> yeah. And it's like one fix is seven minutes in. I was like, right, I'm going to make a 50 second video on how to fix it. It did well. But before that, I did, I was doing Call of Duty videos. I think I probably only got to less than 100 subscribers doing that. But it was just one of those things. It's like, I just enjoyed making videos and like montages. And that's like, I just found it fun to like put my achievements on the internet, I guess. And then, you know, obviously started cycling and that's the main focus. So I just transitioned the whole thing over privated all my Call of Duty videos. Yeah. And... Was it still under the same name? Yeah, yeah, it was just the Redster. I was always like my nickname as a kid, like the Redster or the Red Meister. So, yeah. <laughs> so so you were that guy, and I, I'm trying to build a picture now over the course of the conversation so far. You were you were getting angry as a kid at playing Call of Duty, but then as you got older, <laughs> you thought, hmm, let me share this with other people, and being competitive and, and sharing it and scaling up in that way. And those skills are so invaluable, aren't they? That Like video editing and being able to craft and create something that's something which i have that little window into as well after making gaming videos when i was like 13 on i don't know if you have you heard of runescape of course yeah i was such a sweat <laughs> yeah. i was such oh, a really? sweat on runescape yeah um i was that guy it's, it's funny though like the lessons you learn from video games the biggest lesson that i learned was like such a big lesson so i was playing call of duty this is like the first call of duty i played so it was real early on modern warfare 2 and, you know, I was playing, like, levelling up, you know, going through the progressions, enjoying life. And my friend was like, hey, I can hack you to the max level. So I did it. I pressed, went through all the thing. So, yeah, just press this button and it'll get sorted. I pressed it and I was like, oh, like, immediately knew I'd made a mistake. And long story short, like, realising that there's no more progression. There's no reason to play the game anymore. Like, it's boring as hell. And I feel like that was one of the things that made me realize it's about the journey. You have to enjoy life. Like don't focus on getting to the end or whatever. It's just about trying to make the whole thing like fun. It, it, it's interesting you mentioned that because <laughs> it's almost like part of my grind with just wanting to do big hours on the bike in the winter for no reason because I'm not training to race or anything. It's like, why on earth would you do that? You look at me playing RuneScape when I was like 12, like just woodcutting for like five hours on a Saturday. <laughs> like, you're doing this the same monotonous repetitive task it's like that's just to see like numbers gradually incrementally go off on xp but yeah like yeah. you say like it teaches you quite a lot about i guess like patience and the journey and the you know it doesn't matter when you see the the 99 or whatever on runescape or whatever it was in terms of top level prestige yeah it's, it's always about 
gradually seeing improvement, not necessarily the, the finished product. Because then, what is it to do? <laughs> yeah, to exactly, exactly. Like it must um, be pretty. It must be pretty boring being Wout Van Art, you know, winning all these races. <laughs> well, I think it's a bit different for him, but it would be boring if you won every single race by like a margin and it was easy. It's got to be. It's got to be a bit, little bit of struggle in there. When was it that you kind of? realized you were gaining traction on the, on the YouTube channel just to stay down this content creation discussion. It's hard to pinpoint exactly because it, it just ebbs and flows and I haven't been as consistent as I could have been or wanted to have been at times. At the start of this year, I did a few vlogs on training camp and I was like, I want to pump out like a few vlogs and I was like editing them like proper bare bones on my phone. And that like did really well, especially because I did a video with Francis Cade and he gave me a good shout out. And then I did one with Cam Jeffers and he gave me a good shout out. So that was like a really good like insurgents and i got up to i don't know quite on six thousand subscribers it's all similar similar to the instagram then i guess at this point yeah it's exactly the same except you know with instagram it's like there's the reels and stuff and you hit a good reel you literally like refreshing your notifications it's just like follow 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 and it's, just, it's crazy and then it'll dry up for a while and you'll post like five reels that do nothing and then you'll get another one that just gets like a couple hundred thousand views and it's like that is another addictive thing funny you say that i've been like just this last week, I've sort of started building a content plan. So I want to try and do a post or a reel every day. At the start, without a plan, it's actually something that's really daunting. Like, how am I going to make a reel every day? Or how am I going to make a bit of content? It's, you don't have to make a bit of content every day. You just do something on a Monday or once a week or even once a month if you get really good. And you just bash it all out, plan it all out. And you can get like, so this morning I've done a handful of reels. I'll probably do them more this afternoon because it's Monday. That's like my rest day cycling wise. So I've got time to just try and get a bunch of content done plan it all out and it's actually like it's not that hard at all when you actually plan it and that's something that i've been trying to do a lot more recently like planning do you use like google calendar or something to to kind of visualize everything i mean notion is fantastic if you haven't heard of notion mate don't start me about notion that i discovered that two weeks ago and i've been raving <laughs> no to way. everyone about it so it's, have i so it's have incredible I. what's the deal with notion, notion i could preach to everyone about notion oh my goodness just the customizability it's like for anyone who doesn't know it's a calendar i'm not even sponsored or anything but i'm going to promote <laughs> the hell out of these guys yeah it's a calendar i wish i could share my screen it's a calendar <laughs> but each each element in the calendar has various attributes, but you can customize anything about the attributes. So for example, I've got on my one status, you know, you set that to publish, idea, in progress, scheduled, whatever. You've got a deadline for when you want to actually, you know, complete doing it, publication date, type, if it's Instagram, Facebook, theme, I've I've added themes for like, if it's a funny thing or like an inspirational thing. I'm not gonna, like, I don't want to spend too much time <laughs> just like promoting <laughs> it, but it's, yeah, it's, it's really, it's changed my, I feel like it's changed my whole perspective on planning for social media. So it's yeah, it's pretty good. Absolutely. And just as even just somewhere to, to make notes as well. Like yeah. right now next to me on Notion, this is like really transparent. I've got a few like rough pointers about yourself that we're gonna talk about. And yeah. it's it's all embedded within your podcast episode planner thing in the calendar. Oh yeah. And then you can view the calendar in all these different ways. Yeah. <laughs> we will we, we won't go down on a tangent, but <laughs> Everyone that I've shown uh, Notion to, I remember showing my dad a couple of weeks ago and his mind just exploded. He was like, you've actually found something really good that I didn't know about. So like, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're going down a bit, of a bit of a wormhole here. But with with content creation and hearing how you've been able to like leverage that over time, it speaks to that consistency, doesn't it? Because back in 2017, 2018, you got Downton Vlogs and doing all the stuff as we've talked about, everything that we've talked about, you're vlogging and creating content on, maybe ebbing and flowing in terms of doing a daily vlog and then not posting for like a month or two, or, you know, it's not maybe as consistent as it could be, but you've, mm. it's been six years and you're still posting content. It's not like it, it died away. Like I did eight months of YouTube vlogging and then I stopped. So yeah, it, yeah. it's definitely, yeah, it definitely speaks to how important just keep hammering away at something is. In terms of like cycling as well and sports in general, if a manager is looking at two potential riders for the team and they're like the exact same with as many attributes or whatever, and one guy's got the YouTube and the promotional stuff, easy decision, easy decision. Especially cycling now, it's so, I mean, at the end of the day, a cycling team is just a commercial, like it is just a advertisement platform. At least that's how it's operated, that's how it's funded. I've got an exposure of like, say 7,000 something followers on Instagram. There are like the majority of world tour or a lot of world tour riders have less than that. 
it, it makes a big difference. So I, I'm giving more exposure than like a lot of world tour riders that are getting paid a huge amount. Obviously, they're better bike riders and that's what wins races. But I think especially now, like a lot of sponsors and teams are realizing that actually we're getting more bang for our buck on social media than we are for winning a bike race. To kind of try and re- rewind, because I'm just trying to like think about it in my mind. So far, in terms of the journey, we've talked up until the Vitus and then what came out of that. Then lockdown hits. You're riding for no pins, was it? Yes. When it, when yeah, it was for the first half of the year, it was, it was no pins, yeah. Yeah, what, what was lockdown like for you as a as someone who's trying to, well, trying to make it as a professional at the end of the day and, and really put you all into it? And then suddenly, bang, what's that like? It was so weird for me. So it was that... Uh, I mean, it was it was crap for everyone, right? Like, everyone's had their plans destroyed for the year. But that was, in my head at least, that was the breakthrough year. You know, we had a team. I was on a team. I, I think I had five people who were, like, my mates as, like, just mates. But they were also on the team. And it was such a unique environment, which, to be honest, I don't think I'll experience again. Like, I'll always be mates with my teammates. But, like, was we like Matt mates. and Harry. And- yeah, Matt, yeah. Harry, a uh, different Matt, Matt Webster, and a guy called David. Yeah, I think that was it. So us five, like we're on the team and we're also mate. It was phenomenal. Like training together, racing together, it was just oh so good. And then me and David, we'd emailed like these UCI races in Europe, and we managed to get a ha- like so many invites to these UCI level races for no pins. And like, yo, we can actually do these big races on this team. We've got great kit, but great bikes. Like it, everything was so good. And we went to one UCI in France. Like it didn't go great, but it was our first UCI. I still finished, so it was great. And then obviously. COVID, bam, like, finish. And, you know, it's one of those things as well where the way it panned out, you always had a bit of hope for, like, a couple of weeks' time. Like, it was always like, oh, just a little bit more, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Two weeks and to slow the spread. Two weeks to slow... <laughs> <laughs> That's the one. And then, like, the half the year, the majority of the year is gone. But, like, for me, at least the way it is in my memory, it's almost deleted. And it was almost, like, so negative that I just didn't even allow it to get negative. Like, it was just neutral. It must have been three or four months of training where I just went out and trained, followed the plan, got home, whatever. But I just, it just happened. Like, I don't remember. It just happened. There was no motivation, not motivation. I just did it. That was it. It's so ingrained into me to, like, open up training peaks and see what it is, do the ride. Like, that's to the point where I remember it's happened in the past with a previous coach where, like, I think they would put it late on a Sunday night. So I'd check, thinking it's nothing, so it's a rest day. And then I check for the next day on that day at like 8 p.m. and find there's a roller session on that day or like a session. Like, damn, I have to do it. And I, the amount of, or a couple of times, it'll be like 10 p.m. and I'm doing some horrible session just because I can't, I can't just like not do it because that's the plan. It's like, it's such an ingrained thing. And like you have to have such a, a, a trust in your coach. But then once you do, it's such a routine, I guess. You, you just, that's the training, you do the training mm, and it's that's... never any question. That's definitely something I've, I've learned from Tom as well is the relationship with the coach because he, he changed coach and he had a coach for like many years and then he had to change coach for this year. Hearing him being like, oh, like I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know if I can trust this new guy. And like, obviously you're investing money and time and everything. <laughs> like yeah. for someone who wants to become a professional, it's like, this better work. Yeah, it was I'm, like I'm you're investing your whole life in this guy. Yeah, it's like yeah. you're placing, yeah, it's a big level of trust. It's, it's good to hear that you were... You had that mindset of just doing the plan, whatever the plan said, regardless. A lot of people allow feelings to creep in. They allow themselves to negotiate with themselves if they don't have that structure that's like imposed on them from someone else. Awesome. I mean, don't get me wrong. I still had some low moments. Like I think the lowest moment, you know, do you know the airfield in the New Forest? Yep. Anyone doesn't know, it's the highest point in the New Forest. It's really exposed. There's not a lot of trees. And if it's windy, it's really windy. I had a double flat, ran out of tubes, had to call my mum or my dad for a pickup. And it was so windy and cold. On the road, they have the roadside and they have like a little ditch and a bump. I literally had to lie down in this ditch to like get shelter from the wind so I, I could stay warm and wait there for like an hour while my parents came. But yeah. Wow, yeah. There's, <laughs> there's definitely highs and lows to riding a bike and yeah. puncturing in the winter and waiting for your parents to pick you up <laughs> is certainly a low that I think many of us can experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I ended up moving away from them and I started riding with BCN, Black Cyclist Network. So a guy called Manny, he set that up in London and it's like, as a way to promote, promote diversity in cycling, which as I'm sure a lot of people know it's like, it's lacking, especially down like down south where there's, there's so few. Like I'll see like one or two other black guys on a bike a year. Anyway, beside the point, so I joined that team um, and that was great. You know, that was when there was really not a lot of racing. It was just 
local races starting to coming back where they'd have like 20 minute races and apparently three lots of 20 minute races was safer than one hour <laughs> race which <laughs> the logic the logic's not logicking but anyway we did those races and that was great like just to get into racing again you know you haven't raced for like eight months at that point it's just good fun seeing mates racing with mates so that's all cool and then for 2021 Theo Gegenhart was doing a um, an initiative with Hagens Berman, which is the under-23 team he was part of before he went pro, to help try and increase diversity. So they were looking for riders to give a stagiaire opportunity to, which is like a, an intern role, where normally the idea is you're a stagiaire for the last part of one year, and then the next year you get a chance at a full contract. Unfortunately for me, it was my last year under-23 anyway, so I wouldn't have been able to, but they still gave me the, the opportunity, which was amazing. So I joined them after going over and that was just after I started representing Grenada as well so I'd gone over to the Caribbean Championships and then I joined them for a couple of races like high high level races you know racing Remco and Paul and like a couple of other guys who are like big names which was you know crazy experience racing for like different teams trying out different things and as racing is opening again you're able to like dip your toes in what European racing feels like and then what what have you been up to this year and what, what have you been your your biggest highlights and achievements now that we're, you know, we've taken you through, taken everyone through the journey of how you got to this season and where you are today. What's this year look like for you? Yeah, so this year I joined Ribble, which is another UCI Continental team in the UK. That's been pretty cool. You know, again, like a really, really cool group of lads, like teammates. We've all got on really well. So first, the first half of the season wasn't that great. The first race I crashed. So it's like, it's one of those things to start on a bad foot. It just doesn't really help, especially for things like selections and stuff. So the first few team selections I didn't get into... And then I went to Pan American Championships, which didn't go well either. It's just one of those things. The breakaway went. I wasn't in the breakaway. And then I was out of it for like a week or two after that because the travel took 50 hours, which is a whole story of missed flights. But it took 50 hours to get home sleeping in an airport on the floor. It wasn't great. So up to that point, it wasn't too good. You know, I had a few like local crit wins, but it's not a big deal. And then I started doing well. Like I got like a streak of a few races locally. And then I won... And that be, which is it's still a local race, but it's like, it, it meant something, you know? It's one of those things like when your family and your girlfriend come to watch, it's still a really big ego boost. And then the week after that, I went to Grenada with my sister and girlfriend. So it's like a trip, but it was also for national championships. So I won the national TT and road race championships, which is uh, it's like, it's, it's huge for me. You know, you get to wear a special jersey for a year um, with the flag on it and represent the flag in every race. So that's like awesome. So then, yeah, came back. And then it was Commonwealth Games, which was basically my biggest target of the year. But leading up to it, I didn't know which races exactly I'd be doing. Just so how, how did you even how did you even get selected to, to compete in in those games? Yeah, so with the Commonwealth Games and the Olympics, you get a quota based on national or based on world rankings or continental rankings. So you get a quota based on rankings, and then they also allow quotas for like smaller nations who haven't qualified, especially like for the Caribbean nations. A lot of the smaller nations they usually get like one or two if they want. I think, mm-hmm. I think that's how it works. I'm not entirely sure. But we put an application in for the Road Race and TT and track, and we got it all through. But it was like an admin area where we didn't know which race. If I, was, I think it was a track. I did, we didn't know if I was doing the track until a week before because we thought we were in, and then we weren't in, and then we had to do a, like a last-minute application. So where I wanted to focus on track, I didn't get to. But it's, it's still like amazing experience. So I did the track. That was an, I literally had not ridden a track bike on track for two years. Jumped right into the uh, qualifier for points race, which is like, crazy and then anyone who saw like the news about the big crash so many people got injured and i was like there like at the bottom of the track nearly running over matt wall's head it's crazy but then so that was like that was really cool i knew i didn't have the preparation for it didn't get a result so that's fine focus on the road race and i felt really bad all week it's one of those things you know whether it's a psychological thing or not i was almost at the point where i just felt so drained i guess i was like Am I going to need to pull out? If this gets much worse, I'm going to need to pull out. I don't have a huge amount of experience of external pressure. Or maybe not experience, but I've always found it doesn't faze me so much. Because the internal pressure is so much more in comparison. I mean, external or internal, really. Like, whether it's just the fact that, okay, this is like the world stage. You know that everyone that you know is (laughs) watching it on TV. Literally. Like, I'm sat there with my family and they go, oh, (laughs) there's red. There's a lot riding on that. I can't imagine what that must have been like. Yeah, I feel like sometimes I don't like to admit the pressure or especially like those kind of psychological factors. I don't like, I don't want to admit they can affect me, but you know, of course they do. Um, And yeah, that could have been a factor. But anyway, I got to the race. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to go for the TV time. 
like I'll probably get spat an hour in and I just I started you know going for these moves and I was like I feel absolutely phenomenal like I'm riding with these welter riders just pure adrenaline <laughs> pure adrenaline I cannot describe like the feeling of going through and like people shouting your name and like the crowd screaming and like the flags and the bells unreal and like the camera bike unreal like just for that few minutes that I was off the front with uh Joe was insane uh and long story short I missed the break it was close but I think that's just what happens a all the other guys had six people in the team they can rotate attacks this guy goes next guy goes whatever and for me it was literally just me so it was always going to be tricky and then you combine that with the fact that I wasn't planning on lasting the whole race or not not planning but I didn't expect to at least it was brunch for 20th so I was like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, Cavs in this group. Let's try and out-sprint Mark Cavendish. Like, damn, that's, <laughs> Guy that would be crazy. almost won the most Tour de France, or joint equal on the most Tour de France wins ever. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, okay, let's, I mean, I'm, that's again the competitive thing. When it comes to a sprint, it's like a different, like I switch. I would consider myself a pretty, like I said, I'm a pretty calm person. I, I have a pretty good control of anger. And it's not that I lose control, but it's like such an intense focus. You channel it. Uh, yeah, it's like fully, like, I don't care. I do not care. Like, they, if you look at the video carefully, you can see the random guys, like, leaning on me in a sprint, where a lot of people might back out. It's terrifying. Like, if I make, like, a tiny wrong adjustment steering, I'll go into the barrier and crash and probably get hit by 50 riders. At, at it's, speed as well. At, like, yeah, exactly. At 60k an hour. But it's, like, just the pure, it's crazy. What, well, it's crazy what adrenaline does, eh? But, um, yeah, I was just like, I'm going to win this bunch sprint. I didn't win the bunch sprint. I got rolled by Ethan Vernon, but he's well tour and like I'm pretty not, sure he's not got, too, not yeah. Too, I think he's got ashamed. world champs but medals and on the track and all kinds. So like, yeah, I'll take that. Was Cav in the sprint? He he pulled out of the sprint of like two hundred to go or something. Uh, but I can still say I beat Mark Cavendish yeah. in a sprint. Like that counts. <laughs> yeah, that counts. yeah. So yeah, that was obviously like an insane experience. And I guess like that's still the highlight of my year. And then I think it was a bit quiet after that because I, I didn't think I'd be doing Tour of Britain as a team. That's like the only pro level stage race in the UK. I would have been at six spots. I would have been man eight in terms of selection. That was a really big surprise. Um, and, you know, with a week to go, you can't really train for it. You can do a session or two, but then you're just down to tapering. So, you know, I focus on that a lot. That was, again, an awesome experience. Stage one. I uh, had a front flat. It was at the point when the bunch was quite controlled, so it's not actually that hard to change a flat and just ride through the convoy and just steadily work, make your way back to the front. But as I crashed, I put my foot down and my cleat had, like, cracked. I didn't realise this at the time, so I'm thinking, fine, get the wheel changed, off I go again. I go to pedal and my foot, like, I clip in and it just pulls out straight away. I'm like, oh, well, that's weird, that never happens. I clip in, pull out straight away. I literally did that, like, ten times, just, like, in denial, because I'm like, my cleats never broken in my entire life. Like, how is this happening now? And I knew I didn't have spare shoes. I had spare shoes at home, but they weren't set up. So I was like, damn, what, what do I do? So Colin, um, my coach, and who happens to, or he happens to be my coach, he's the DS for the team. He was like rummaging around in the boot. Uh, he finds some other guy's spare shoe and it happens to be like one size smaller, but you know, that's nothing, it fits. So he whacked the shoe on. His cleats happened to be set up in like a near enough position to the point where after five minutes of riding, I didn't even notice. So yeah, had but by that point the convoy was long gone, so it had to absolutely smash it with a bit of help from the car. But obviously that's normal. Absolutely like smash it to get back on. So that was fine. But that's stage one. Stage two, like I was not looking pretty. Had a crash. Had to ride the last thirty k solo. Stage three was that was pretty grim, but finished. And then stage four, that's where I finally cracked. In fact, I was cracked in the morning. To be honest, it was one of those days. You know when you wake up and you just know that it's going to be a tough day, and lo and behold your legs just haven't got it. Just um, don't show up. No, exactly. Uh, so that was I mean, the end of that. But I suppose you weren't doing too much stage racing. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the racing you were doing with one day big races or crits. I've only done one stage race before in my life, and that was a three-day stage race, the Isle of Man door this year as well. So so you think yeah. that, that probably contributed towards... I mean, obviously, it's, it's towards the back end of the season. You've got a lot of fatigue from racing. And even if tapering, you know, you're doing a four-day very tough, you know, top level race and yeah i mean it's, i think that for me the main thing is that i got out of it like obviously it's motivating to see that level but cycling has so many levels it's unreal it's unreal like so there are there are guys like the some of the more climbery guys on our team getting dropped and then it's still a bunch sprint they call it a bunch sprint at the end of this day when it's 
actually just been savage. But you look at a guy, so say Spol, he's a sprinter, and like there are there are guys who are like probably describe themselves as clients getting dropped, and this guy's getting around and then sprinting, and it's like, okay, that just helps you appreciate the levels, and it's like what you thought a sprinter was. Like a sprinter is a myth. I was talking to my mate the, the concept of a sprinter is a myth. It's nowadays, or I don't know if it ever wasn't the case, but a sprinter is someone who's like a phenomenally good right bike rider overall, all round. They can climb, etc., and they also just just so happen to have like fifteen hundred watts in the tank at the end of a really hard stage. So it's like just changing that perspective. It's it's definitely motivational, like to see that level. But it's also like okay, let's just let's rethink like how I view myself as a rider. I suppose it tips the importance or the significance toward being all-rounded and being just having a huge FTP and being able to re- go above and below and recover. The context in which you're riding when you're doing like E12 crits or even an even a nat B when it's like a reduced bunch finish, you can lean on your sprint a bit more. And yeah. I mean, obviously, you're 90 times or 95 times out of 100, you, you're going to win a bunch sprint because you just you've got that kick. But then. Yeah, when you race at that level, you realise, okay, crumbs, I've had, like I have to have a four hundred watt FTP and be able to do five hundred watts for two minutes up each climb. <laughs> yeah, to be able exactly. To, and then do fifteen hundred watts for ten seconds. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, that's awesome. It sounds like you had a really good season. There's a couple of things I kind of wanted to to delve into off the cuff, and when you're sort of making the decision between racing for Grenada and racing for the UK, obviously you've grown up in the UK, but you're like you, you don't have your loyalty completely one on the other. Like you are the, the the exact product of both. But did you feel at all that it was unfair to like other people from Grenada who'd like lived there when you went when like when you flew over and did the championships? Like what was the competition level like? And was there any part of you that thought it was easy or or not? <laughs> there is there is a bit of that. So it's like I've always considered myself half Grenadian, half British. I don't I don't like to say I'm one or the other, but you know the way things work, you have to be one or the other for sport for cycling for all kinds of things and obviously growing up and starting cycling in england you're just automatically cycling british cycling you're british that's just whatever and then you know exploring like the idea of changing obviously opens up opportunities like i'm not going to pretend like that wasn't a factor in making that decision that's another one of those things like i talked about the whole identity thing and i feel like that part of my identity had been not left a bit but to a degree like it, it just it fallen a little bit and i wasn't i guess on a personal level representing that side of my heritage as much as i'd like to so that was another thing that helped uh that helped make that decision so then yeah like you said going over to race there the level is lower than in the uk as you can imagine it's a smaller much smaller it's a hundred thousand people who live there the cycling community is is smaller as well you know there's like probably 20 guys maybe 20 30 total and at the national championships it wasn't a huge feel so yeah, the level the level's lower. I want to say it was an easy race because I pushed myself hard, but I got the win. You know, I was able to win both. So and yeah, I do like it's a tricky one. Obviously, I'm in the advantage position to have access to the racing in the UK and like the coaching and all that kind of stuff. So I guess yeah, just I'm the, the advantage, the the overall privilege of like living in a very wealthy nation compared to yeah, I mean, exactly. There is there's all that. I am at an advantage. Um, but equally, I go over there and I, my the way I, you know, talk to myself about it is like I'm now able to represent that, bring more exposure to Grenada, increase cycling, and hopefully that further develops. And, you know, when I'm in a position to, I would absolutely love to give back and in some way help, you know, whether that's by like getting bikes flown over there. That's a, a big goal of mine further down the line to, to be able to facilitate that. I mean, I've already, I sent, I recently sent a couple of barrels of kit over. So I did like a donation on my Instagram where I said, hey guys, if you've got any spare kit, parts, whatever, send them in and I'll post them over to Grenada. So I had, because I had a bunch of kit, like so much spare from all teams. So yeah, literally a few weeks ago, we sent a couple of barrels because I was going to do one barrel, ended up sending two because we got so much, you know, helmets, shoes, uh, kit, just to make it that that step to starting cycling a little bit easier. So hopefully that, that increases. And you know, now, because I've done well at like Commonwealth Games and Caribbean Championships, the government is now funding it more as well. So now Amazing. we're able to send a bigger team to the next Caribbean Championships. So there are these other guys who are getting more opportunities as well. So it's, it is slowly like picking up and yeah, I'm happy to help there. Amazing. I, I think that's that's a fantastic um, perspective and um, attitude to have towards it. I mean, that's, that's all you can do really, isn't it? 
It's a question that I've I've wondered, but I I don't want to ask it in cynicism. You kind of answered it with with that answer, but I did also have one other question, which you you'll provide the answer. So I I, I kind I kind of already know what the answer is going to be in terms of going down that route. But again, take this as the devil's advocate, the cynic speaking. Yeah, no worries, no worries. For example, I I'm here and I and I'm seeing you taking these opportunities, which you're obviously working as hard as you can given your available circumstances. But from an outsider who sees that you've maybe been given opportunities that you wouldn't have otherwise been given because of the fact that you're mixed race and you've got the Grenadian heritage, what, what, what do you say to someone who, who would say, oh, well, Theo Gagenhart wouldn't have given the opportunity to you otherwise? or Because that... A, you know, a part of me think that, but I, I, I didn't want to. No, no, no. It's, yeah, yeah. No, uh, it's like, interesting... I have been asked that before. Have you? And people, okay. people do say that, and it's like, I think the best way to explain it, or at least the way I and a lot of people view it, is that there are an unknowable number of opportunities that would have been not given to me or taken away from me, or that didn't exist purely because of the fact that I am black. Like as simple as that. Like racism does exist. And I think what's hard about explaining it to other people is that for the majority of the time, it's not, it's not like explicit. It's not obvious. It's always subtle. It's always, almost always, especially in the UK, just for the nature of the culture here. Like it's not like America where people are often, you know, saying slurs or X, Y, Z. For the most part, it's just, it's, it's like that, that subtle thing that might be the difference between you getting an opportunity and another guy. Again, it's unknowable, like, it's impossible to know how much, but I know for a fact that it exists from the various occasions that things that are obvious do happen. And it, I, I don't even bother, like, trying to think about how much there is, because you'll just drive yourself insane. All I know is that it does exist, and that's the reason why I'm getting these other opportunities. Like, at least from, from Teo, there is, there's a reason why, well, there are many reasons, but that is one reason why there's a lack of diversity in cycling, I think especially at a competitive level. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's fair to to get some opportunities as a sort of, you know what I mean, just to balance things out. I mean, it'll never be 100% fair. You could argue for forever on what exactly is worth how much, but there definitely is an element of, uh, of opportunities not existing because of racism. So it's nice to get some opportunities back it will struggle or take a very long time to happen naturally. And I think it's almost something that I subconsciously, or I didn't realise how much of an effect that made seeing someone who looks like you succeeding in, in the area you're trying to. Looking back, so I don't know if you know Nation's Number One Beast, uh, Corey and Justin Williams, they had YouTube stuff, like similar to some of the stuff I make at least, where they'd have these GoPro montages of them like doing these crits and winning. And it's like, it's awesome. And I was I was watching those when I was like, literally bef literally before i got my first bike like i would be watching these videos like that's awesome like that's so cool and it didn't even occur to me that seeing like other black riders like succeeding made the difference but they were like they're the only at the time at least they were pretty much the only guys putting content out there doing that you know there's also like rasan bahati who's made pretty similar videos but yeah it, it definitely makes a difference it makes a huge difference i i think then you are also being that for other people in what you're doing now you know? well exactly that's what i'm hoping to, i mean again that wasn't the the motivation to do it in the first place like it's happening more and more now a couple of weeks ago someone i met is like yeah my kids are half jamaican they watch your videos they think you're like absolutely amazing they love you i was like oh my god i could cry like it's just hearing that and i hear it like a fair amount you never even dream or think about being able to make that kind of impact to people but you do and that's on a level with my own like successes to me Say, for example, in some hypothetical world, in 10 years' time, you won the Tour de France. That would pale in comparison compared to the thousands of people that that would inspire seeing you win yeah. Tour de France, if that makes sense. Great discussion so far, and I kind of wanted to, to bring things gra gradually to a close. But I guess we're looking at from where you are now, where do you hope to go in the coming seasons? And, and not just cycling as well. What is life? What, what are your aspirations more broadly as well? So I'll start, I think I'll start with more broadly, actually. I think, like, from a personal development perspective, the last, the couple years from COVID to 2020 and 2021, I almost say like a red 2.0, like a revamp, right? So I was really focused on, you know, like I said, bringing up my confidence 
and just sort of yeah just focusing on my personality from that point like it's not like i wasn't happy with my personality but just like bringing the level of energy that i would to a video or like talking to you now i always find it easier talking on camera than maybe sometimes talking in person or at least people i don't know i think that was the crucial thing just being more more confident so I was, like i said big improvements there and now like i said the last couple months have been development for me in like planning so that's an aspect where like, I just have to admit I lacked quite a bit like videos the reason why they're so sporadic is just like I wasn't planning for them so now I'm trying to you know I started planning my um my content I started planning my food which like again the last few months last couple months even has made a huge difference you know I've always known how to like cook a healthy meal but like, when you plan it out you're never at that point where you haven't got anything left and you have to resort to something that's substandard you just go you just bang 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 you're just doing it right consistently so you like meal prepping and things as well not quite meal prepping i find like i sometimes i'll meal prep but the quantities is just oh it's so much just because especially because i eat so much food as well like i'll fill a wok and like that's one meal and that's just like the vegetables and, and the sauce and stuff and then it's a whole 300 grams of pasta or something so only, I usually, only like, cyclists would know. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Only 300 cy- grams of pasta sounds so obscene to pretty, pretty much everyone I've spoken with <laughs> yeah. like at uni. But it's like, yeah, well, without it, what are you going to do? <laughs> like, You're just going to not get enough calories in and just gradually become a skeleton. So <laughs> you need yeah. to fuel yourself like that. Oh, well, yeah. The amount of like 1,500 calorie bowls of pasta and, and veg I've had is just, yeah, it's, it's you're, short. You're definitely but... on the carb hype train. Oh, absolutely! Once I discovered that, it is mind blown. It really is. My I could do a, I could do a whole rant about that, but I'll just I'll brush over it for now. Not but quite yeah. during rider level, but yeah, <laughs> not quite thirty bananas a day, but nearly. No. Um, but yeah, planning for food, even if it's more of like an internal plan, but just you know thinking ahead and being aware of it. Combined with the content plan, that's like where I'm making big gains personally at the moment. So that's why I want to increase that to the point where it's like as second nature as doing my training is because it's so hard to focus on all the different things at once but when they're a routine it's like you can separate it and you can start to to focus on other things with with your energy and then for cycling so oh, i haven't announced my team for next year but i am moving team so hopefully announcement coming fairly soon i'm really i'm really looking forward to next year i should have some really like a good good opportunities throughout the year so yeah i'm, I'm super excited for that and then at the end of the year there's oh, so oh there's so much there's world champs which is in Scotland like it's close again so so Commonwealth Games is in Birmingham a couple hours drive up the road three hours drive up the road uh, next year world champs I mean it's a bit further but it's in Scotland so it's like it's not far far you know also oh, are you competing in the world champs road race next year yeah yeah I would oh, wow. I, wow. I would have been able to I was gonna do it last year and then because I was ill I just couldn't recover in time so I had no form so at the last minute I pulled out because it would have cost like a grand to go it's because at the time of covid tests they were so expensive so yeah but this year again it's australia i'm not spending a grand to go to australia but next year that'll be super close and then pan american games which is like so it's like commonwealth games but for pan america so america canada all of south america all of that so that'll be a really that's a big focus actually um i'd love to win a medal especially on the track i think i want to dedicate a bit more time to track because that yeah off the track anyway then after that 2024 olympics it's crazy to think as a kid i wouldn't even dare to dream about going to the olympics like it's just not even like olymp like that thing on tv that happens every four years that's cool whatever now i've got a pretty a pr- like a really good opportunity like you know a pretty good chance of going to the olympics it's just a case of qualifying so i get you know just need a few uci points which i should be able to do over the next 18 months and then yeah i mean i've always i've always said from I, I don't know how long, maybe like 10 years or something. I don't, I'm not big on tattoos. Like, I don't want any tattoos. Um, <laughs> but if I ever get a tattoo, I'm, I want an Olympic rings tattoo, um, like having gone to the Olympics. So, yeah, that's a massive goal. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Where would you get it? Ah, oh, on the arm, I think. Just like a, a forearm, uh, something like that. It's got to be obvious. It's like a flex. <laughs> yeah. Finish line, Ziz pose. Yeah. <laughs> Olympic rings. Yeah. Class. Even the Olympic, just going to the Olympics on its own, if that was the highest I could get, and I, could, I you know, I tried with everything, every fibre, and I couldn't, I couldn't get any further than that, I couldn't get any better results, then I'll be happy. Even if, like, from now, I don't get a better result, but I committed, like, 
one hundred. I did everything right. Then sure, like then I wasn't good enough. That's I can accept that. But I know, I know, I've got more in the tank. I'm just going to keep pushing until, well, yeah, I, I'm convinced. Like I, you know, I've got the confidence to think that I will get better results and I will keep improving. Hundred percent, fantastic to hear that. I think especially on track as well. You you suit the track, obviously, uh, in terms yeah. of your like your physiology and the way you've trained as well, and uh, the fact that you were able to jump into the Commonwealth Games and get through. I mean, I know given the circumstances with the crash and things, but still. It's like okay. Im- imagine if you train. <laughs> yeah, imagine if I rode track. And Everyone actually, is done. <laughs> like, yeah, it's fu- it's funny you say that, but yeah, my physiology is like track rider physiology. But it's just from a commercial point of view, there's not really many levels. You know, you have to. Well, it's either Olympic team or nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, exactly. But that, luckily now with Grenada, that is like that is an option, and obviously mm. I, I want to do road as well. But if I wanted to just do track, you know, they support that. So that's quite. It's just good. Yeah. It's. I'm. Um, yeah. It's cool. It's cool. I'm looking uh, forward to. I, I see you've been in in the gym as well, and into all the into all the gym. I don't want to say TikToks, but you know the gym reels and my all those, my all those Instagram stuff. is just gym reels. That's all it is. Yeah, that's... literally the same for me. That's all. <laughs> all I hear is hard style and people <laughs> people seeing like middle aged women in the gym and. <laughs> <laughs> calling them mummy and all that kind of stuff it's like oh my gosh like what a strange yeah. like end of the internet to, to be a part of yeah i know it's funny <laughs> like you'll probably notice like half of my reels are inspired by like gym talk reels but um yeah i'm looking forward to get back in the gym actually but obviously it's off season i've got an amazing um gym coach he's uh he's got a gym in um winchester and they're like he's just awesome i started with him last year and it's just like having that separate coach for gym has been like game changing. Like a, a personal coach who's actually there with you is just a different, Definitely. again, just another game on the uh, on the progression. Do do a few quick fire questions. We, we did we did have a, only a couple of questions that I managed to see that were that were sent in, and you'll you'll you can guess afterwards uh, who sent them in. <laughs> uh, but before before we do those couple of questions, I know you mentioned your sister is a big gym goer. Who can squat more, you or your sister? Oh, I think she might, she might, she might get it. I think she could, she can definitely hip thrust more. She's hip thrusting unreal numbers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> unreal. I, I, I see some of the videos of, of these, of these girls doing hip thrust. I'm like, like, how many plates? <laughs> I know. She, and she deadlifts like 120 for reps. So I, th- I think I could out deadlift her, but not by much. It's actually, I'm like, it's one of those things. She's only like started doing it properly in the last year or so, and it's like, damn, I'm I'm some proud proud brother right now. It's it's so cool, amazing. Okay, first question comes in, and it says, "Big spoon or little spoon?" <laughs> I don't know who said that, but I like a fifty-fifty. You know, mix it up. Some days it's big spoon, but some days you just feel like the small spoon. You know. <laughs> The night after tour, uh, the night after <laughs> like stage after... four. <laughs> yeah. tour that was a small spoon. That's though. a small spoon moment. <laughs> uh, the next one, I'm not sure if it's a question, but it just says like something to do with the cafe being five miles away, but never actually oh, being that close. Yeah, no, that's that's Jacob's fault. How how do you feel in that moment? Angry, uh, pure rage, pure. Di- no, no, no. I'm not angry. I'm disappointed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, right, awesome. Well, I think that wraps it up. I don't know. It's been so interesting to hear, like, the not just like the journey objectively. Like, it's a very easy just to go 2017, I did this. 2018, I did this. But it's like how you've developed as a person through that and how how you've got to where you are today. I've asked us of the guests that have been on so far. They've all asked the same question, which has made it kind of funny. But have you got, have you got any questions for me? This can be a one second gap in post production. <laughs> this can be a one. Okay, okay, okay. What's your long term goal for the podcast and, like, I guess your platform in general? So I really saw this as a bit of a, a, a rebrand or a refresh. Like you say, with the way you've developed personally in terms of planning and things, I definitely feel like this, this next chapter of my life, I want to go down the route of psychology in the future post grad. And maybe do a mm. master's and maybe even do a PhD, I don't know. But I feel like I've developed in the skills of leadership and communicating 
and editing as well. And I really want to just share that. And I'm so interested in people's psyche and different angles and perspectives. And so the aim with this really is to explore my own curiosity and produce cool reels, I guess, like like you are. Like I've I've made quite a few in the pipeline of just like training stuff or motivational stuff, which you can say it's cliche, but those things help people when they see them. Um, yeah, it was motiva- it's all motivation. And it, yeah. it does. It works. And so that, that's the plan, really, with this, is to try and... I mean, I guess the primary aim isn't to grow it. It's, the primary aim isn't to grow it, necessarily, mm. but it's just to have really interesting guests and almost, I guess, as a byproduct of having like guests with a good following and who are good people, then it means... It's like you can stepping stone your way up in terms of a podcast. Because if yeah. I was asking like a professional cyclist or someone who owns lots of businesses to come on a podcast because I'm really interested in their psychology, it's like, well, I can then show all the people I've had on before, and then you and then that person comes on, and then it's even more people to kind of yeah, vouch you're just for how like good the podcast step is. up the yeah yeah. But obviously, I don't want that to be the aim. Like, I just I find people really interesting, and I love understanding it. So. And hopefully other people do as well. I mean, I, I guess that's what that's the only reason why you'd listen to this. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where I'm coming at it from. But as you've proved with consistency, I think I just got to stick at this. And it was like ninety or ninety five percent of podcasts or something don't get past ten episodes. So mm, that's, that's it. If, if, that's the first aim. <laughs> exactly. Like half the people just as long as you're not quitting, you're already beating ninety percent of people. So, and then after that, it's just keep on going and and commit to it precisely but anyway thank you everyone for for listening thank you red for for coming on to the podcast i really appreciate you giving up your time thanks for having me if people don't know which i probably would have would be pretty obvious by this point but how can people follow you uh instagram the underscore redster um yeah youtube is the redster so that's pretty much my only active social media oh and tiktok but that's just the same as instagram these days so yeah (laughs) Awesome. Thanks for listening, everyone.